Um, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming. Um, Dan and I are, uh, I'm Jason Walker, this is Dan. I've got a little slide to give a little more information about us. Um, but a while ago, we were working on some automation stories and uh, kind of came up with this whole idea of shake and bake, and we'll get into what that actually is derived from. Um, the big thing about what it is that we are focused in on doing and what we want to present on is how we make use of Chef and some of the ecosystem uh, uh, to be able to manage and create uh, a large scale data platform uh, and doing it, doing it in a very automated way. So it's automating data and analytics foundations with Chef. Uh, about Dan and I, Dan, if you want to say a little bit sure. about yourself. Hi all, I'm Dan Getsky. I am a senior data platform engineer at Cargill. Um, I've been working on Chef for about four years, working with Chef. Um, I focus on the big data analytics environment at Cargill, so that's a Hadoop cluster. Um, so as you can imagine, uh, automating that is a, there's a lot of configurations and a lot of nodes. So um, it's been a fun experience. So I'm Jason Walker, I'm one of the uh, uh, lead enterprise architects, uh, do a lot of architect and engineering. Um, Dan and I work in a group inside of Cargill called Cargill Digital Labs. And one of the areas within Digital Labs is our digital foundations teams. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that and show some of the stuff that we do. Um, let's just get right into some of the stuff. Um, a little bit about Cargill. Um, just by a show of hands, have people heard of Cargill? Holy crap, that's nice. actually, it. now are, are, these, are you all like in the Midwest in some way? Because usually, uh, Cargill is the largest company nobody's ever heard of, at least in North America. So it's the largest privately held company, definitely North America, potentially all the Americas. Um, been around for 150 years. Uh, big purpose is uh, to nourish the world, uh, and our mission around that is to help the world thrive. But we want to do the, these things in safe, responsible, and sustainable ways. Um, we'll get into some of the, the size and scale of, of Cargill. Uh, we under recognize that we're not going to be able to achieve uh, that purpose and that mission without the use of technology and doing those things in a safe way. Uh, we're steeped in legacy. We have about 2,000 locations around the world um, that are all manufacturing plants of some sort. So we're really good at building up uh, long-running uh, pets, if you will, that are, are, that are out there. And we're talking about uh, locations that do um, grain milling, that do, uh, they create oil, or they do food ingredients, that type of thing. Um, and we have these foundations that are in place that help us in those areas when it comes down to large scale agriculture, supply chain type endeavors. Um, but within Digital Labs, our big purpose, we we'll go, go to the next one, our big purpose is um, pre preparing Cargill for a digital future. We recognize that in order to do things in a safe, sustainable way, we need to make sure that we've got a bedrock of, of digital foundations that will get us to a point where it's no longer about plant manufacturing, but being able to connect with the, the new age of farmers that are making use of things like digital, mobile, and are looking for analytics and data to be able to help them with their decisions. And so we, uh, we recognize that through that, that progression, um, because we are steeped in legacy, we're gonna have to be really right paced about the types of investments that we make. And it's not gonna be all of a sudden everything's going to the cloud. It just doesn't work that way if you run plants that are like in the middle of Africa. It just doesn't work like that. But we definitely need to get the bedrock in place, and that is where Digital Foundations is, is coming into play. Um, so I, wanted, I do want to talk a little bit about um, size, scope, scale. And I promise you there's only like 12 more slides just to kind of set the stage, and then we're actually going to um, deploy a live feature into our engineering environment. Um, but from animal nutrition to risk management and a lot of different things in between, Cargill is engaged and leads in a lot of different markets. Uh, the, ecosystem is, the ecosystem that we participate in um, it's really diverse. There's a lot of compl complex and complicated things around what Cargill deals with. Uh, we have about 150,000 employees. We do business in over 70 countries. And with all of that, regardless of the fact that we're private, there's tons of regulation, tons of different things that we have to deal with. And all of this is within this, uh, the idea of uh, uh, our mission to help the world thrive. So we'll talk about two things about what specifically Cargill does, if you don't mind jumping to the next slide. Uh, anyone heard the phrase of don't boil the ocean or Stop trying to boil the ocean. Well, Cargill, as part of our food ingredient business, uh, we, we uh, sell sea salt. Cargill has the pr business problem of boiling the ocean. We literally have to ev evaporate ocean water to get the salt out in order to put it into a, 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 a resellable uh, container so that you at home can put sea salt on your ingredients. Cargill has to figure out ways to sustainably boil the ocean. 
Like, we just don't get to go, no, no, don't do that. No, like, we actually need to do that. Um, so sea salt is sourced from seawater. Like, that's a problem that we have. Um, anyone go to McDonald's and en enjoy any type of egg from McDonald's? Uh, thank you. Please continue. Uh, Cargill is uh, the, the main supplier for North America, uh, all the McDonald's eggs. It's about $2 billion a year. Um, and it is, the, if it's Egg McMuffin or if it's the scrambled egg mix that is in like the little tortillas, it's all of them. Now, uh, it was one thing to be able to, to be in a position to say, we are going to supply all the eggs to McDonald's in North America. Uh, and it'd be roughly that window of what, like six to 10 is when they do breakfast. Well, about four years ago, McDonald's did something that was, uh, that was great for them. They went to all day breakfast. Like all day they serve breakfast, which means now as a supplier, we actually have this really big problem of supplying at any, almost any point in time. We have to completely redesign our supply chain in order to be able to satisfy the demand of McDonald's. Like, we're not going to tell McDonald's no, right? Like, oh, go find eggs someplace else. No, no. If we're going to keep doing that, we have to modify and adjust for this type of, uh, to be able to respond to this type of demand. Please go ahead. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so architecture principles, in order to, to, allow, to, to, stand up this, uh, to stand up this bedrock, to get the, these foundations in place, we need to, to land on some common language, if you will, across how we're going to be able to do this. And we have eight architecture principles. We're only going to really kind of uh, weave in four of these. Secure, secure by default, build security into the solutions that we're talking about building. It not be something that, you know, down the road we're going to have somebody do like pen tests and tell us after it's in prod that like shit's broke. Um, I'll probably be the one cursing up here, I bet. But, um, data accessibility, in order to be able to do things like understand the, the kind of changes we need to make to the supply chain, using the McDonald's example, we need to get accessibility to the underlying data to understand, hey, well, as we make changes, are we actually creating value for our customers? We need to keep things simple and standard. Um, this is where it turns into, if we make it to where it's just super easy and frictionless for people to do things like get their data into a data platform or data lake, they're going to naturally gravitate towards that because we've actually made it easier for people like in data scientists to do something that is easier. Uh, and then customer focus, the, the priorities and things that we look to build into these digital foundations is all driven by our customers, our internal customers, that eventually are doing things like trying to build business value um, for, for external customers. So people that are working with McDonald's, we don't directly work with McDonald's and digital foundations. We work with those teams that are working with McDonald's. We've got to make sure that we're providing the right features at the right time. Go ahead. Almost done, I promise. So we talk about needing to have platforms in place, and we have three big ones today. We have a data platform, we have a cloud platform, we have an API platform. But before we get into like, what those things are, we need to kind of define, like, what are we talking about when we say a platform? How is this anything different than like, a shared services team that deals with um, you know, just intake, output, and just running through different uh, like queues, if you will. Like, hey, I need a CA cert. Well, here's the form you have to fill out, and then we'll eventually get to it. No, we need to actually provide. Too soon? Too soon. We have some CA cert issues. Um, so defining a platform comes down to the platform itself is a means to an end. Like I always tell the folks that are doing engineering on the platform, you're actually not here to be a platform engineer. You're here to a certain opinion about the way you can reduce friction for other people to get stuff done, which turns then into let's get our builders, our developer community, let's build these platforms in a way that they're able to do things like build stuff so that other people can use their stuff. Hopefully we make money or we're doing things in a positive way and sustainable, but we get it to where our builders are able to actually um, build things and make it to where people are able to consume it. Feedback is a gold mine. Uh, customers being able to say, hey, this is working, this isn't working, whether it's good, bad, negative, whatever the case may be, all of it is, is feedback that we, we thrive on for ourselves internally. Um, if we don't make use of modern software practices, we're not going to be able to be agile in our, our digital delivery. Um, and so we, we often will just make use and, and correct ourselves. We never use capital agile. It's all lowercase agile, just being agile, right? And then we measure our outcomes. We want to make sure if we're adding a feature, um, we can display what the value proposition we thought we were going to get and what we're actually able to deliver against. And whether you think of that in like transactions per second or some, some sort of way that we're able to derive value in, in, in dollars, uh, we make sure that we, we get those things to be uh, accessible to our customers. 
All right, so unlocking data. Let's talk about data accessibility. We need to be able to have a place where we can get data in these different areas, these different enterprises inside of Cargill, and get it to where we can centralize the data, we can aggregate it, provide some light touch governance, uh, and then collaborate on these things. So when customers come through and they say, hey, I need this new feature, we'll do things like have them open up an issue in GitHub, and then we end up having a collaborative conversation about what are some of the, what's some of the acceptance criteria? What's the thing you're actually trying to do? Not necessarily how you're trying to do it, um, but we get ourselves in a, in a place where across all of these areas, we are able to um, provide set of features, set of capabilities in an open way and make it to where we can do things either inner source or even out, outsource, uh, not outsource, uh, open source, um, different type of features. An example of this, when it comes down to not only the simple standard um, and customer focused, Cargill on, on GitHub, so github.com GitHub slash Cargill, we open sourced a tool called PipeWrench. And it's basically just some Python scripts of how we internally will do things like ETL data out of disparate systems and get it into a Hadoop environment. Uh, because we made it simple and because we standardized it and gave people internal reference apps of like how to hook it up to LDAP or how to deal with Kerberos or how to move things around and, and get data injected, it becomes a common language that people that are trying to get data from one point to another point are able to just rinse and repeat. And now the community is actually making use of PipeWrench and they're able to cross pollinate like different ways to be able to fix things. So now we're gonna get into, I think this is now where you get to talk. Darn it, so almost, close. Almost. Data platform is born. All right, so we've got this place, we've got this thing. Um, we need to make sure that we're standing this up in a way that everyone within Cargill is able to make use of it. Um, Cargill data platform, lovingly referred to as CDP internally, um, is all about the, uh, that big data life. So streaming and batch ingestion methods, uh, making use of pipe wrench to make it very easy for people to understand how to get it in there. Um, standard consumption interfaces, because everything is standard and simplified, we're able to scale these things up and understand what the environment should look like, baseline normal, and then when things get out of, uh, out of uh, what we define as normal, understand where those points of break, or you know, where those break points are taking place. And then analyze, uh, analyze, visualize, and evangelize. We do things like have office hours where people are able to come and say, hey, how do I? Or will you help me? It's an open time for people to just come and it's not an interrupt time. Nobody's like hurting each other's feelings or being like, hey, I have this problem. It's open time for people to be able to, to connect. Um, so that's just one of the areas where um, we're able to, via this platform and via these services, be able to connect the community. Now I think, <sighs> All right. Dan's gonna talk about like actually doing some stuff. So I'm super excited. I'm gonna but, sit down. Um, we actually created the system, Shake and Bake, uh, during last year's ChefCon. Um, so we were sitting at the hotel there, we had some time to burn, and we are like, if only we had a way to deploy Chef in Amazon with AMIs, easily from GitHub. Um, so at that time we were working with Chef. Um, it was very much uh, like git pull, kit fetch, knife upload kind of a world where like that works, but um, you know, you get someone new on your team and they're like, okay, well, get your knife set up and get all this stuff set up and you know, have you used Net Chef before? Or do you know how it works? Um, we wanted to kind of take out that friction, take that away. Um, so we created a system called Shake and Bake, uh, self-titled as the presentation is here, uh, which might primarily involves these four components, GitHub, uh, all of Chef, and the coordination is done via GitHub, uh, internal GitHub. Uh, drone is our CI component. Uh, drone is used to build RPMs, upload Chef cookbooks, uh, make changes to our configurations for the Chef server, uh, our control plane. Uh, Terraform is used to create instances. Uh, the CDP data platform is entirely AWS based. Um, and so we uh, use Terraform to interact with those resources. And then finally Chef to uh, build the AMI images um, and make sure things are running the way they should be. Yeah, or, yeah thanks. Uh, so a little bit about how Chef looks like for the data platform and Cargo. We have five Chef environments. Uh, we have the environment Drona for dev, um, which is kind of like the dev prod. And then we have the environment Peanut, which is our prod prod, um, and some various engineering environments, uh, one of which we'll be making changes to later on in this presentation. Uh, Cargo internally has 28 uh, internally created cookbooks that we use for controlling the various uh, CDP-related components. Um, 
within those 28 cookbooks, there are 170 recipes. Uh, there's always more. So there's a plus on all these because I'm sure there's more, you know, since I made this slide. Um, 200 plus AWS instances that make up the CDP. Um, and we've done over 1,700 uh, drone chef deployments with the system since last year. Um, and so get a lot of use out of it. Um, and uh, I very much like it. <laughs> We have um, everything that gets deployed through our cookbook infrastructure automatically gets uh, data sent to Elasticsearch, Kibana kind of interface. Um, and so we are able to, by the time a node gets bootstrapped into Chef, um, it's going to be sending telemetry and logs and all sorts of great stuff. And uh, we are able to easily track uh, anomalies. Um, it's kind of just like a given. It's no longer like, is there metrics coming out of this thing? Like if it's running through our pipeline, you just get that. Um, you don't have to explain to somebody like how to set up Datadog or how to set up Logstash or Filebeat and any of that stuff. Um, so the CDP has some metrics on it. Uh, we have 20,000 tables, um, always growing. Um, I think on our highest day, we saw about 900,000 queries that, that day. Um, those are like SQL queries. And so those are, um, we use Impala in the CDP, which is a SQL front end for uh, big data environments, and uh, on any random day, we'll have about 300 plus unique active users, um, which includes process IDs, uh, so like things that are automated, and also live users, uh, like hitting uh, SQL queries interactively. So user experience. Um, I made reference to reference apps that, that we've created, and one of the things that we built internally was a beer demo uh, a demo app about, about beer. There's a UI, there's an API, um, and the platforms that we have, I mentioned cloud platform, API platform, and data platform, beer demo actually consumes all of those to give people a, a sense of an idea of like maybe how to build an API, how to host a front end that can talk to that API, how to get data down into CDP. Um, but one of the things that we, one of the things that we have, what have you done? I'm trying to get out of full screen. Um, one of the things that, the, uh, that we have as part of one of those customer-driven features is, hey, in our APA space, one of the things we'd love to have is a cache, like cache contents behind the scenes so that we don't have to hit back end so often, especially if it's like we're just trying to get information about maybe a beer that isn't gonna change all that often. So one of the things that we have is, uh, I think you're... Trying to get... Enhance. 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 Maybe say when. Enhance. All right, that's not looking any better. Your color scheme. It's probably my color that's, scheme. That's fine. Um, so one of the things that we have here is we are hitting up against a particular endpoint. Um, it's an endpoint that's on the internet and it just has some information about beers. I think there's about 5,900 in there, give or take. We're just gonna uh, uh, exercise a little bit, but one of the things that we're doing is, is you see there are headers that are in here that don't give any cache details because there's no cache yet. So our gateway is set up to say, hey, if the, ga if the cache ever exists, um, we're just making use of Redis behind the scenes. I'll start to pull from cache based upon the contents actually being in cache as opposed to going to the back end. So we can see things like the, the proxy latencies, the upstream latencies, et cetera. What we're going to do is, um, I think the, the slide that we had was like, hey, Kanban board. And, but nonetheless, Dan, what I'm wondering is in CDP, do you think it would be possible for you to deploy uh, just a basic Redis in, 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 uh, basic Redis environment um, so that we could maybe add cache to our API platform? You bet. Uh, so now we actually get into the demo. Hooray. Thanks for hang hanging out with us. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, GitHub, well, how everything works here. And uh, we kind of pre staged uh, basically just like a bump of this metadata file. But this is the Redis cookbook um, running in our data platform organization. Um, just that, that's all I'm changing, but I can kind of show you that there's, uh, basically all this does is uh, install Redis, uh, like yum install Redis, uh, make sure that the Redis user exists. Uh, we're gonna set up a, a unit file for Redis, and we're going to make sure that the configuration directories exist. We're gonna lay down a, a Redis configuration in sensitive mode, because we don't like to uh, share things with people that shouldn't see it. And uh, set up a little temporary directory for Redis, var lib Redis, and then make sure Redis is enabled and running. So that's the cookbook. I have created a pull request, which I will get to. 
which will show you the shake part. So if I go to drone, you can see that uh, the first step it does it, in drone is it clones the, it needs to get the code, so it clones it down. Um, as a way to kind of uh, save time, we just do a, a simple Knife Cookbook test. Um, it's just like a syntactic check to make sure that uh, you didn't make any silly syntactical mistakes. And then we do the shake part, uh, where this is the, uh, as it, like sometimes you need to shake a couple times because it didn't, didn't stick. Um, so this would fail if your uh, build failed for any certain reason or your inspect test didn't pass. Um, and so I can kind of go through this here, showing you that there's no funny business. This is just pulling down a generic uh, CentOS image from Amazon. Um, we are, again, installing uh, version 5 of Redis. We are laying down our systemd file. We are uh, setting up some configuration directories, laying down the file for Redis conf, uh, making sure Redis exists, and uh, make sure Redis service is enabled and running. And then finally, some inspect tests here at the bottom. Uh, Redis should be running. Uh, the user Redis should exist. Uh, Varler Redis should also exist. Service Redis should be enabled and running, and it should be listening on 6379. Um, so at this point, um, our pipeline has passed the shake. Um, and so I would hand it over to my buddy to approve, which he has. Looks good to me. So and, I, one, one thing is you're clicking this. Um, what, so what Drone is doing is it's making use of a custom plugin that we created that just pulls in things like Test Kitchen. But it's a, it's a, it's, because it's a Docker image, it's consistently running the same things every time. So the shake process is making use of our drone server that runs inside of AWS, uses an IAM profile to be able to take actions against the AWS API, spins up an instance, deploys uh, via Test Kitchen, deploys uh, Chef Client, pulls down all the, all the uh, dependencies, um, goes through, runs its, you know, compare, compile, converge, uh, and then runs inspect against it. So the instance is spun up in AWS live using a particular AMI. We add things to, on top of it. And then at the end, tail end of this, uh, the shake process is, hey, after everything works, we then delete the machine. So it's basically spin it up live, deploy, now tear it down. So instead of it being a, as Dan was saying before, instead of a new developer coming on or wanting to see, hey, I want to submit a pull request to make an update, they don't have to worry about having Test Kitchen on their machine or having Vagrant or some sort of other dependency. We keep it all up in the cloud, which is where the machine is going to live anyway, and make it to where it becomes really simple for people to do things like submit an issue or submit a PR to up make updates. So we're going to merge. And now we'll see Drone reflect a slightly different state than it did before. There'll be one extra step, well, two extra steps, I lied, uh, called bake. And so we've got, like, we're going to shake again. This is good. It's good to, like, Make sure it's good. And then uh, the bake part of the step is where we actually save the Amazon AMI uh, so that we can later on in this presentation call that AMI to uh, skip the whole um, like downloading packages, and uh, which takes the most time usually for anything. Um, so we can get an AMI that's got Redis running on it. Um, and we know it's passed all our tests. Um, and we also as part of this integration step. Um, at the same time, we also upload this cookbook version, 0.2.3, to our Chef server. And so this single drone job, the shake, bake, integration, ooh, uh, kitchen cleanup, again, which is where it destroys the environment. And then we, uh, we use Microsoft Teams at Cargill. Um, and so drone will give us feedback in our Teams channel for CICD, uh, red, red, yellow, green. Um, Green it passed, red it didn't, orange. Uh. Um, so we can go to the various stages to watch this happen. Um, it's going to hit the little play button down there. It allows me to scroll as it works. So right now what it's doing is it is uh, creating the Amazon EC2 instance. And so we're waiting for that to become available. I think end to end, this was what, taking what, three and a half minutes? About well, three minutes, yeah. Three, so far. Most of it's just like spin up my EC2, bring up SSHD, um, and then like yum install. Um, and then the rest of it's pretty quick. Saving the actual, the bake portion is about a minute. And obviously, that always depends on like how much software you've installed. So, like when I'm running this against like my full Hadoop stack, it takes like 20 minutes to save that because like there's gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs and gigs of data. 
Um, but for something so simple like this, uh, it's pretty quick. And so another part of, uh, we can speed up that saving process, and like we can speed up this whole process by um, taking the output of a build like this and then making that the AMI start point for the next build so I can skip the whole Redis install part because then I can use this AMI image as my base plate and then run from that going forward. So if I'm only changing like a small configuration file within Redis, uh, I don't have to like install it again. I can just start with that AMI, make my change. Um, our resources are configured such that things auto restart. So like it restarts by itself. Um, and oh, we're already done that. Yeah, hey, while we're waiting on the, these last couple of steps, so once in, in you were mentioning that it takes a long time, or it takes about 20 minutes to, to build out the full-fledged. Like a full Hadoop stack. Yeah, so yeah. Um, what, what is it, uh, talk a little bit about what it looks like in deploying that into production. Like here's a new instance, and like rolling sure. the notes. Right, getting it into the actual state, uh, the longest part of the time is the Terraform. Uh, since everything is there, the notes come up, and we use Cloudera Manager. Uh, work Cloudera shop, um, and so the notes come up, and they like bring themselves into Cloudera Manager. So by the time um, everything's up and running, I just like refresh my Cloudera Manager UI and like give it some work, and away it goes. And we just did this. Um, we rolled our entire production cluster in a week. Um, we wanted more cores, more memory, um, more disk. We wanted we went from CentOS six uh, seven two to seven six. Um, and we used the system, and it was great. What kind of downtime yeah. is there? Because everything's HA. So this is the point where it is waiting for the AMI to get uh, to, to finally be available. So it takes a few moments behind the scenes in AWS when you say, hey, take this image and create an AMI, create a machine image from it. Uh, and I think this was what, like within seven or eight loops? And it's just, mm -hmm. it just keeps hitting the API. Is it ready, is it ready, is it ready? And then once it is ready, uh, hoping that, that was gonna be enough time, boom. You get, it the AM, you get a little, little detail about the AMI. Um, drop down the integration. So I'm gonna copy this because we are gonna deploy this. Um, but again, the integration step, uh, since I was actually, like the, part, the whole point of this was to get a new cookbook out there as well. Um, we've actually deployed Redis 0.2.3 to our kitchen, or our chef server running in AWS. Um, being responsible user different structure, we've destroyed it. And then we're gonna send a little notification to teams here at the end saying that our good work was a massive success. There it goes. So like I pull up my team's channel here. We've got some green lines showing that like Redis cookbook was successful. Oop. And so great, so now what have we done? Uh, we've uploaded a cookbook to our chef server in AWS, and we've created an AMI image uh, with the contents of that cookbook on it. So now we need to get into the real world. Um, so now we use something called Tenille. Um It's got a goofy name. <laughs> I won't go into details about it, but uh, essentially what this is is Terraform under the same um, idea. GitHub, drone, Terraform, uh, chef. So we've got... Uh, I'll paste that AMI image in to this uh, EC2 resource. Uh, this is gonna be Elmer 104. He's gonna be the, the new dude hosting Redis for us. So I'm gonna push this up. We are gonna see a slightly different drone set up. Again, git clone. And then at this point, we're gonna run the Terraform plan. And it's a little goofy because of the window sizing, but essentially what you see is that uh, we're at, oop, we're adding one EC2 instance into AWS with the AMI that we just built. So like if that AMI didn't exist, this step would fail. <laughs> so this looks good so far. Um, again, I will send over this pull request to my good buddy, Jason who will review it. So the Tennille thing, real quick. Uh, our cloud team has a pipeline called Captain. So the data platform team has a pipeline called Tennille. Captain Tennille. <laughs> I couldn't let that go. Like we had to address, I, we had to address it. I liked the mystery about it. Like why would they call something Tennille? 
Oh, both is fine. So um, I'll just keep refreshing this. Maybe I'll just wait until he says it's ready. <laughs> oh, you'll know. Yes, sir, you do. Okay. Jason has approved our changes, and now we will send forth our new AMI into the engineering environment of CDP. Get ready. So one last time, drone's gonna spin up. Uh, you saw before it did the Terraform plan, now it's gonna do the Terraform apply. Um, and so here it will uh, go about actually uh, making that change. And so if we go to back to our console, oh no, that's too big. I want to see both. Uh, we can see that we're still not caching anything over here. There's no cache tags. Um, hopefully, so I, as the uh, API gateway owner, I'm like, hey, you've got that Reddit. We got anyone familiar with the Wu Tang song "Cream"? Like, cache rules it. So now we've got cache. The so cache rules it, but different cat. Never mind. <laughs> a couple laughs. A couple laughs. Um, Terraform told us that it was created. Um, if anyone's familiar with Terraform, that doesn't mean that's actually available and like listening on SSHD or anything yet. Um, so it takes a, maybe another 30 seconds for um, Redis to start listening and SSHD to start working. But um, So I, as the uh, API administrator, the owner, would now say, hey, let's turn on the cache option, but the cache isn't quite ready. So we have a quick timeout, and it's going to sit here and just keep timing out until this piece down here says, hey, everything is, is it, once Redis is available, this will now start to uh, produce the header information about cache, either hit, miss, information about the age of the contents, et cetera. Allegedly. Oh, there we go. So we intentionally broke it so that we can actually see, hey, here's the there actual change that's taking place. Um, typically, what we would have is uh, uh, probably a less of a uh, outage or a timeout issue. It would just be like, hey, once it's actually there, let's go ahead and enable the, the cache. But we wanted for demonstration purposes to actually uh, show things like here's the cache key, uh, the status. And I think up a little higher, there's a header for the age. Um, and that's just the, the age and the cache. So what we have now is a customer of digital foundations cloud, API, and data platform, when they're saying, instead of everyone going back to the, the back end to get information about this beer, Grimberg and Blonde, if it's in the cache, like we can set a TTL for it, do those different types of things, but now the back end is not gonna be hit every single time there's a request for this particular beer or for other subsequent beers. Um, what that allows us to do is look at some of those legacy systems that are on-prem that don't have a means to be able to scale up. Like we have, hundreds of ERPs. All of those ERPs are not gonna be able to sustain a digital transformation of, let's have all of our customers hit the, hitting them at once. By being able to deploy and use automation, we're able to add these features in a very quick way and be able to add these additional features and make it to where um, it's gonna be a better overall customer experience. Back to the slides. So. Customer-driven features and priorities, we now have in our engineering environment a cache that our customers are gonna be able to use and consume and start to look at a, a ways that they're able to, to uh, benefit uh, the application development life cycles that they're dealing with. I think it was just... They didn't show up, but it's fine. What didn't show up? Apparently my Git clone was out of date, so I don't have them. But oh, well the last one was just a recap. And I think maybe I just did that. Uh, open it up to questions. Yeah, please. What were some of the pain points that you guys came across in this process? Yeah. Uh, what were some of the pain points that you guys uh, ran into in this process? What did you see uh, the biggest uh, issues to overcome around scale or around uh, you know getting the cookbooks to operate in a specific manner? Um, I think the the hardest part for me was. Uh, the environment was very much manually put together when I got there. Um, and so it was like backfilling all of this automation into like a, a big data environment uh, uh, took a lot of work. But um, I think in terms of setting up, like is your, is your question specifically around uh, making these plugins or around just like managing big data environments with Chef? Uh, yeah, I mean, just in the process that you just showed us, right? It looks great. It looks sure. like you're able to do a lot of cool things. But like, yeah. where did you come in across something where it's like, hey, we actually have to solve you know, this thing because it's not behaving the way we want it to behave. So how, you know, 
Mm -hmm. Basically, if we're going through these things, what, what things might we encounter that we'll have to overcome if we try to duplicate sure. something like this? Yeah, yeah. so um, the, the, the hardest part about it was, uh, so within Cargo, there's maybe 40 or 50 AWS accounts. Um, and so actually collaborating between the data platform and the cloud platform, which is where, like, cloud platform does the baking and all the, all the stuff you saw on the screen happens in cloud platform, but the data platform is in, like, a, an entirely different AWS account. Um, so, like, how do I... And GitHub is in a different account. So there's all these, all these there's like a connecting all these AWS accounts and getting all these things together was the hard part. Um, like Docker and everything ensures that um, the process is going to be the same as long as all, all the pipes are there. Um, and so that part makes it very simple, but uh, orchestrating um, rights. And so like how do I give access to one AWS account to share AMIs with me? Um, how do I make sure there's actually um, like EC2 limits are there? Um, and so if there's like 20 people shaken, um, like some people don't get it because there's not like not enough EC2s there. Um, so those are some things that happen uh, in terms of like scale, um, but from a uh, technolo technology perspective, um, it's all like behind the scenes, all like knife upload stuff, um, knife cookbook uploads, um, and then their AWS CLI commands. Um, and so uh, configuring AWS CLI, if you're not familiar with that, can be kind of slippery, but um, I think some of the uh, the non-technical things were probably bigger rocks to move than, because uh, I mean, we go through and look at just from like a systems thinking perspective and say if it's a matter of you inherit a system that maybe doesn't have the automation that you're after, to be able to start to add new features through an automated process right. sort of turns it into a hybrid. But as long as you just take, you're taking your time and thinking about what is actually the priority and what's the thing you're trying to solve, um, the non-technical things can turn it into which yak are we actually trying to shave now? Because next thing you know, it's all I wanted to do was one dumb thing, but I'm six layers deep because of like non-technical reasons, right? Just no, no, you have to have a meeting with that person or that team in order to get the sign off. And it's like we're not like we're not asking for approval to do some stuff, right? Like no, no, you have to get like team A to approve. Approve what, right? Um, so I think the non-technical things, um, getting people that that are traditionally, in, in Cargill's context, looking at like plant operations as a function of IT, as an example. When they see things in an automated way, it, it, isn't, like, it isn't in their context. And they just will look at it and go, there's just some voodoo magic going on over here. What, what do you mean that you just built up an instance, tore it down, and now you have this machine image? It's a uh, Cargill, part of the things that we're working towards is Make sure they are in a position to understand what this actually means and what it actually does. Um, and hopefully we're able to, to uh, make some traction through the, like, simplifying the way to do it as opposed to it being like your workstation needs to have a certain set of software and dependencies and what have you. Which particularly um, at Cargill's tricky because uh, we have a super aggressive proxy. So um, get, trying to get things like Chef, uh, like Vagrant and, and Kitchen and all those things to work and, and actually pull things down yeah. from the internet at Cargill is like a huge disaster. So. Um, like this has been a huge enabler for people to get started right away. Like your first day, you can like people know GitHub. At least you should know GitHub if we're hiring you. But um, like you can make a GitHub commit and then like throw your code out there, and uh, you'll get feedback via the drone terminal right away. Um, instead of having to like what version of Chef do we use here? Like you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, it was a huge like for me. It was a huge um, big day for me to roll through those automated node deployments, because until then, like, when stuff would break, I'd be like, I don't know why, like, who set up this node, like, what version of OS is it? Like, we had CentOS 6 and CentOS 7, and, um, like, we had some Am Amazon Linux stuff, too. So it, was yeah. like, it was all over the place. Um, and, like, now everything is, like, the same image, and it's been huge for me. I think that uh, maybe the biggest thing around, like, the gotchas is having thick skin to realize that we're probably going to miss some of the things in our telemetry and to be able to circle back and have those be continuous stories of are we actually measuring the right things so that when it turns into uh, maybe our cloud service provider accidentally unplugs the wrong cable on a back end on a, on a control plane and like half the stuff goes down, we clearly see when, what, can dig into why and figure out um, ways to, to recover quickly. But without that telemetry, it just sort of turns into a big shrug, right? That seems like an oddly specific example. Uh, because maybe that happened maybe to that, us. Maybe that happened. <laughs> um, we, we lost like half of our production cluster was like unplugged on accident, at, um, and so yeah. like we were very quickly able to scramble and get that stuff figured out. Um, and it wasn't like get somebody up who built this machine. It's like run Chef, deploy the nodes, 
everything's going to be great. All right, cool. We've got a couple of minutes left. If there's any other questions, otherwise, very thank you very much for uh, for coming. Appreciate the time. Uh, hope everyone was able to to find something informative about it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.